Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. We are very pleased today to be hosting and jointly presenting the E15 report. Thank you. Strengthening the global trade investment system in the 21st century. Uh, this is a report, obviously, led and organized by the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development with backing from the World Economic Forum and accordingly has had a lot of dignitaries involved, but it's also had a lot of great minds. Those two categories, dignitaries and great minds, are not completely mutually exclusive, um, including two of our institute fellows, Gary Huffbauer and Robert Lawrence. And so we're very pleased to be giving you some of the fruits of this multi-author large-scale effort to think about trade and ways to move the agenda forward. I think the um, ICTSD agenda, and as, as shown in these documents and as will be discussed today, is particularly important because it is at the sweet spot that many of us in sort of the policy think tank community try to do, which is be practical without being trivial. Um, and that's not easy. Uh, there's a lot of defeatism in the trade arena for obvious reasons. Uh, there are a lot of things one can do that just some particular interest group or corporate or country wants. But to actually come up with things that are actionable, will have material benefits, and are supportive of the system is a non-trivial exercise. And I commend the members of this group, uh, led by Ricardo Melendez-Ortiz um, and Richard Sammons, I commend them for, I think, getting that just about right, uh, having really practical things to say, in particular for helping emerging markets and developing countries get their fair share of the trading system and take advantage of the opportunities, and doing so, again, keying on the word sustainable in an environmentally friendly fashion. Um, this is a period, obviously, where the Institute is being very active on the trade front, and uh, some people we wish weren't active have decided to make themselves loud on the trade front as well. Um, we will be, towards the end of this month, releasing our second volume under the leadership of Kathleen Chimino Isaacs and Jeffrey Schott on the TPP. Many of you attended or read about our previous event and writings on that. We will be featuring a paper ahead of that by our colleague Robert Lawrence on labor issues in the in the trade world and in TPP. Um, we also will tomorrow be holding a event with Commissioner Malmstrom from the EU talking about TTIP. Um, it is, of course, on the one hand, difficult, on the other hand, idealistic to be continuing to press forward with TTIP in an environment where Congress is not being terribly hospitable to the negotiated TPP but it is also of critical importance to continue to do so, and we look forward to having Commissioner and her, Malmstrom and her remarks tomorrow. Just two other points, if I may, before introducing today's speakers. Um, seemingly on a different topic, we released uh, in the last couple days a small institute briefing that we think we are hoping already is having an impact called Reality Check for the Global Economy. And it is mostly a macro look at where the markets have, we think, overreacted to the downside in a way that actually matters as opposed to simply being mistaken. But included in this is a very interesting Chapter 5 essay by Carolyn Freund, fellow here at the Institute, called Global Trade Growth, Slow But Steady. And we will be having an event in coming weeks as well featuring her take on why there seems to be a slowdown in global trade growth and volumes, but also that of Gary Huffbauer, who will be speaking later today, and a call, uh, some outside colleagues, basically looking at questions of, is it cyclical, is it structural, is it the lack of movement on the multilateral front? What is causing the, the slowdown in trade, and therefore, how importantly should we take it? But I think, it's, I think it is worth all of you, even as trade types, picking up our new publication and to sweeten the deal looking at Carolyn's essay on the trade volumes in it. Final thing I would say is um, I think it's important that we sit here and try to come up with, again, practical, constructive win-win 
things in the field of trade, which actually isn't as hard for, as one as some people make it out to be, where we've heard so many falsehoods foisted in pandering fashion upon the people of Michigan and Ohio in recent weeks um, about what trade has supposedly done to the U.S. and about how poorer nations are, are taking advantage of the U.S., or richer nations as well. Um, most of which is, is, though heartfelt, believed by various people is complete and other nonsense. And, and oh, a while ago we had another trade-related event and we were talking about the moral obligation in the U.S. to do more to assist workers, not just trade-affected workers, but workers in general. And someone made the remark, well, I look around this room and it's a room full of winners. And, you know, that's all very nice. It's a good rhetorical punch, but it actually is very misleading. Let, let's remember that most people are winners from globalization. Those people are the people of the U.S. Those people are the people of China. Those people are the people of Eastern Europe. Those people are the people who followed the right path of integration in Latin America. Most, you look around any room, most people are winners from globalization. And it's in that spirit I want to introduce our speakers to talk about ways of increasing the, low, the gathering of low-hanging fruit, the number of winners we're going to have. Uh, what we're going to do is have four speakers initially, and I'm going to, as is our forum, introduce each of them now so that they can just come up sequentially. Gary Clyde Huffbauer will lead off. He's, of course, the Reginald Jones Senior Fellow here at the Institute for more than 20 years. Previously was Director of Studies, the Council on Foreign Relations, and was Professor of International Financial Diplomacy at Georgetown and is the leading scholar on too many practical trade issues to name. We are delighted to have Gary engaging on this and contributing to this report as well. He'll be followed by my old friend and colleague, Robert Lawrence. Robert Lawrence has been a non-resident senior fellow here at the Institute since he left the Clinton administration in 2001, where he was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. He is, of course, a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and has been an influential scholar on the, not just trade, but all the trade and, trade and labor, trade and development. And we are looking forward to his remarks. As already mentioned, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz has been the co-founder and chief executive of the ICTSD, the International Co Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. Um, and he is one of the principal conveners of today's E15 initiative we're talking about. He's been an advisor to the UN Secretary General, the WTO Director General, very active in Latin America, in Colombia, um, and including as a negotiator at the GATT and WTO, and he will be giving us a further picture on the way forward for emerging markets. And finally, we will have Richard Sammons, who is a member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum. I think everyone here knows this, but the WEF is not just about the Davos meeting. It's a lot of other activities, and their joint work with the ICTSD, I think, is one of their best examples of that. Uh, from 2011 to 2013, Richard was Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute, and he's worked on international economic policy for President Bill Clinton at the NSC. Um, after the four of them speak, we will have open discussion with our on-the-record high-level audience. And then at the end of that period, I will ask our, our colleague and friend from the World Bank, Annabelle Lopez, to come forward and give us some closing remarks. So, but I will introduce her more properly at the end of the session. Thank you all very much. And I believe we agreed that Gary would go first. So, Gary. Thanks very much, Adam, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, there's quite a bit of intellectual ferment around the issue of in investment, foreign investment, by which I mean foreign direct investment. And that ferment is reflected in the, um, in the E15 report on investment. I'm going to try to give some flavor of that in, in a few remarks. But before I do that, I want to mention that our colleagues, um, Ted Moran and Carolyn Freund, have a very good paper coming out which has some illustrative examples of what uh, three small developing countries have done 
to attract uh, foreign direct investment in quite a successful way. <clears throat> okay, there's a picture of inward foreign direct investment stocks, a uh, little coloration by the uh, uh, different countries. The, the blue line is the world. And you can detect there is a flattening out of the growth of uh, world foreign direct investment, a uh, little above 20 trillion and some areas are flatter than others. And this becomes more evident when you look at the flows of foreign direct investment. We have not yet returned and see no, see no sign of returning to the level <clears throat> just before the Great Recession, which was about 1.8 trillion. We're down, down at the 1. say $4 trillion range globally, and that's mirrored across. So that's kind of a setup for looking at the issues. Okay, what are the purposes of a regime for foreign direct investment? And this is what's under discussion. For most of the post-Second World War period, the view was, by nearly all countries, that the purpose of the regime was to encourage more foreign direct investment. Good for the host country, good for the home country, of course, there were dissents, but the general view was we need more foreign direct investment and the regime should encourage this through investor protection against the uh, unstable uh, political regimes which exist in many developing countries, uh, the absence of judicial regimes that are effective, and so on and so forth. More recently, the discussion, the ferment that I referred to, has focused on creating policy space for sustainable development, which, of course, all those terms need <coughs> definition, but uh, uh, environment, uh, labor, and so forth. So that's, that has come very much to the fore, and it's part of the <coughs> E15, very much a big part of the E15 discussion. And then there's a third item <clears throat> which is beginning to creep in, which is the tax area with the big OECD study, which I regard as misinformed. Uh, my colleagues on the E15 think it's gold. Uh, I think it's less than lead. But in any event, uh, the, uh, uh, there, there's some question of whether this should be put into uh, somehow the investment regime. So that's where the, where the ferment is coming. And <clears throat> that then turns to investor responsibilities. As I said, for the most of the post-war period, the question was, what are the country responsibilities when they attract foreign investment? What should they do since, after all, these foreign firms, they, they don't have political representation uh, to the same extent as domestic firms? and all those kind of issues. But now the question is, should <clears throat> the investment agreements have, you know, these kind of OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises built in? Should there be some requirement that a, a firm adopt social responsibility standards and be reviewable? Uh, should the contracts be public documents? That tends to be a big issue in the resource area, but it could be an issue in other areas as well where governments are giving, you know, building uh, industrial parks or putting in ports or roads. And uh, <clears throat> should the resort to investor state dispute settlement, which is a core feature of, of buttressing uh, the protection angle, should that be conditioned on good behavior in some way on the part of the, of the uh, corporations. So those are the issues at point. And then there's a question about what is the forum for investment agreements. And here, you know, history always matters. And in this area, we have a lot of agreements. We have more than 3,000 bilateral investment treaties and chapters in uh, uh, free trade agreements. They're not all identical, but they follow kind of a general model uh, in terms of outlying the responsibilities of the home country and, 
and the investor state dispute settlement and so forth. That's what we have now, and we have a lot of double tax treaties, which is a separate track, quite a separate track, uh, several thousand of those. But should we uh, look for a new model, and it should it be under the auspices of the World Trade Organization, uh, which has been shy on getting into this area. Many developing countries did not want it to get into this area, and it has not so far in any great way. Or should it be under the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is based in, is, is housed, I should say, in the World Bank, and acts as an umbrella, it's the major umbrella for uh, disputes, ISDS disputes when they come up, but it doesn't have any model treaty or anything. But should it augment its uh, mandate by, by developing a model treaty? Or thirdly, and I should have had this on the slide, should the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, uh, do a model treaty? UNCTAD is a very different creature today than it was when founded, it has done uh, really extensive work on world investment, and, you know, it might be another place for housing. And if we have one, uh, you know, kind of a model which is, has aspirations to be a world model, how does it relate to those existing treaties, which are, you know, number several thousand? Should it be an option to come in when the treaties are renewed? Uh, should it be um, minimum standards? What have you? That's, again, part of the debate. So just some concluding observations looking at the at the playing field, most firms uh, like the current system. I mean, after all, they had a lot to do with, with building it. And they are concerned about watering down investor protections through any kind of new uh, multilateral model. Um, uh, and then if we look at the public beliefs, according to Pew polls, you know, most people like greenfield investment, but there's a lot of distrust of mergers and acquisitions, which is the biggest form. More than 75% of foreign direct investment <clears throat> takes a merger and acquisition uh, dimension. Um, and then there are NGOs which violently object to ISDS in any form. They just don't want it at all. And they're quite skeptical about both, both inward and outward foreign direct investment. And so in this ferment which is going forward, which the E15 process has, uh, I would say, launched, you know, who's, how's, how's the tug of war going to work itself out across these dimensions? Uh, the recommendations that Tyler and Moran and I did are in one of the think pieces done for the E15. I won't say it was adopted as a majority view, but it's a very solid view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I, I should have followed Gary's lead and uh, spoken specifically about one topic because this is a project of such great ambition uh, and, in fact, scope that trying to comment on all of it is, uh, is, is virtually impossible. Uh, what we have before us, in a sense, is uh, the wealth of the wisdom of crowds. Uh, and it is considerable. And so I, I want to begin by uh, congratulating uh, the uh, organizers uh, and the uh, huge number of participants who uh, have come up with uh, an incredible array of thoughtful uh, pieces and recommendations. And um, uh, anyone interested in trade policy broadly, uh, this is going to serve as, in a sense, the starting point, the starting place where, where you will have to go in order to see where, um, what people are thinking about. And I actually think that um, perhaps by coincidence or design, the launching of this program is exquisitely appropriate coming in the aftermath of a recognition 
that the Doha Round and its agenda uh, is has, has uh, actually in its in its completeness has gone nowhere. That there are elements of great value within that agenda, uh, but there is now a question of where do we go from here. And uh, while uh, I think wisely, no effort is made uh, to uh, give us a new uh, detailed ad agenda, uh, there, are a, 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 there is a wealth of ideas uh, that, is, that are uh, uh, prevalent throughout these, uh, these, these, these papers. The, uh, the second point I would make relates uh, basically to um, uh, my, uh, what was striking to me as I, uh, as I went through uh, quite a few of these is that there is a remarkable consensus out there uh, that while people differ on individual uh, 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 parts of, their, of what they would like to see done, there are some uh, emerging themes. And I, I would just like to mention a few of those that I uh, took away from from the discussions. The first is that um, what we need to do is to appreciate uh, that the trading system is as they, what they call an ecosystem, that it isn't simply one institution, uh, the WTO, or one set of formalized agreements, but in a sense a large number of um, networks, and participants, and actually as they bring out in, in numerous of these studies, uh, uh, integrally related to a lot of other issues. And so the interaction between things like climate change, natural resources, regulation, competition, all impinge on trade, and trade impinges on them. And what you see the authors wrestling with is how to reconcile those uh, tensions. Uh, another theme that emerges is that um, to operate well, the trading system cannot be a, a top-down set of rules which everyone obeys. In fact, the rules are just the starting point because there has to be continuous uh, feedback between uh, uh, private uh, uh, firms, between uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, with the government uh, on a continuing and sustained basis. Uh, a third dimension that comes out in, in many of the recommendations is how complicated things have become. Uh, you know, we have the famous metaphor of the spaghetti bowl, uh, of this multiplicity of agreements. And so what you find is as people are dealing with particular issues, they, almost all of them, recommend improvements in transparency and in the exchange of information and ideas. So we have a hugely complex structure and it has to be better uh, integrated, but the first step is actually getting people on board as to, as to what is going on and it is really complicated. And then just the final Big takeaway, and, and for me, uh, an area that I have a, a great passion for, is um, uh, uh, how do we restore the centrality of the World Trade Organization in this vast uh, web and network of, of, of different types of trade agreements? And uh, the thinking here is that uh, the WTO itself has to evolve. It has to move beyond the notions of a single undertaking, a single set of rules, which all countries ought to adhere to, although it might well contribute a minimum set of rules that all countries need to adhere to. But then there is the ability for groups of countries, for coalitions of the willing, if you will, to come in to, through the WTO and to uh, negotiate various forms of plurilateral agreements that can go far deeper uh, and, in a sense, a construct 
uh, a much more variable geometry in which uh, countries can um, uh, choose to join uh, areas in which they uh, believe that they would like to integrate further. And so whether these uh, are, relate to investment, whether these relate to, uh, they could relate to labor standards, they could relate to uh, just a host of different issues. But in a sense, ultimately the question is how do we uh, use the opportunities of, these, uh, of what has already been negotiated at the regional level and take it then to the much more inclusive uh, WTO where uh, countries can participate. So um, uh, it seems to me, and, and, and throughout uh, the, uh, the different papers, you see recommendations of that sort. And then there are um, a set of uh, specific proposals. And as I was reading through you know, there were lots of them that I just hadn't thought about. And I thought uh, uh, numerous parts were, were, really, were, really, were really neat. Um, uh, one idea had to do with rules of origin, just to get precise. You know, and the, the, the authors pointed to the fact that, um, and apparently the Canadians already started to implement it, and that is, if you're talking about least developed countries, what you know, if you study uh, this area, um, yeah, you, least developed countries are given duty-free, quota-free access to markets, but actually on condition they make a certain amount of value uh, within that country or in the country that's doing the importing. And they can't meet these rules of origin. So fine, they have the access, but, it's, but it exists on paper alone. Actually, a real good example of this is the United States uh, 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 concessions and special uh, preferences we've given to Haiti, where the Haitians simply can't qualify for the rule of origin. Well, the su suggestion here is uh, to uh, allow for uh, accumulation in two forms. One would be to allow all these developed countries to contribute to the value addition that is required for any least developed country to qualify for the rule of origin. And a second would be to allow for all countries with whom the importing country has a free trade agreement to contribute to the value addition. So I just cite this as one idea, <laughs> you know, and, and as I say, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of this, these kinds of suggestions peppered throughout the, the document and um, uh, the, uh, I, I think the authors are, uh, are to be commended. Um, there are proposals throughout um, to move beyond simply formal agreement, uh, agreements in order to establish networks that exchange uh, ideas and actually uh, ensure that things operate on the ground. Networks, for instance, that um, deal with global value chains. Uh, the big problem, if you, for instance, work on Africa, is not that they don't have a lot of agreements, or the Middle East, for that matter, and other parts of the world. It's that actually, <laughs> when you go and look at what happens on the ground, you see it isn't even implemented. Now, in order to ensure, or at least to promote implementation, what you need is a continuous uh, interaction between the users of, of the customs uh, and the customs themselves, in a sense. What you need if you're going to have global value change, uh, chains is an exchange of information between those who might be interested in buying and participating and the producers who might have to uh, meet the standards. So there's this promotion of these kinds of, of collaborations uh, that uh, permeate uh, a lot of the concrete uh, suggestions. And that too, I think, is, uh, is, is, is really useful uh, and important. Uh, let me close just by saying, of course, um, you know, they, <laughs> they got thousands um, of, uh, uh, of ideas. The coverage is immense, but they left out some things as far as I'm concerned. So I've just got to uh, just briefly note uh, some of those uh, that I feel uh, 
in their next grand uh, project, maybe they'll think of including. One uh, actually relates to the question of domestic adjustment and jobs. Uh, clearly very <laughs> salient uh, in the current debates in the United States, but I would have loved to have seen um, uh, just uh, similarly, similar kind type of work where people exchanged ideas on, on how to facilitate adjustment, on wage loss insurance, on what kind of training programs work uh, well around the world, the kind of uh, uh, global participation that we have in these projects really could give an immense wealth of uh, ideas on that notion. A second uh, related to the question of the broad question of safeguards, uh, which uh, wasn't really tackled, uh, but I think uh, at times is very critical in facilitating an open uh, trading system. A third uh, related to the question of immigration. Uh, I mean, there are grand proposals uh, for an open space for the exchange of um, uh, people who understand technology and researchers uh, to, to, ha to have sort of much greater global mobility among, among the experts. Uh, but in the current environment, uh, when we discuss in, uh, immigration, uh, I, I think it's problematic. And so, so uh, I do think, um, a, a, again, as, as sort of one of the um, uh, topics in which the trading system is embedded, given what's going on in Europe today, given the debate in the U.S. today, uh, it, it did seem to me that that's a, an area I'd like to see covered. And then finally, I, I, I can't stand up here um, at the Institute and not talk about exchange rates and their connection to trade, or maybe it's a good thing that they didn't talk about it, uh, but, but um, in some clarity on that question, uh, which I see uh, often uh, from, from the vantage point of an economist uh, invoked uh, in, in very inappropriate uh, uh, places uh, for very inappropriate reasons, I think some clarity from a group of experts on that question also would not have uh, gone, uh, been amiss. So with that, I'll close and uh, look forward to more discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Adam, and uh, thank you for the hospitality. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here at the Peterson Institute, but also in Washington to talk about this, um, uh, this report and the recommendations that have come forward. Um, I think what, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the context uh, in which we thought it was important to uh, organize uh, such an exercise and then uh, focus on maybe two or three issues that I think are relevant to, to uh, talk about at this time specifically and finish with some ideas of what we would do uh, going forward. So the, the, just very uh, quickly on the description of the, of, of, uh, of the project and why we did it, I, I, let me just start by saying that uh, th the reason we, we thought that there was a need to have a thought process that would be led by experts uh, on its first phase in isolation of, uh, of governments and delegates, uh, negotiators on, on trade, uh, it uh, has much to do not only with the stalemate in negotiations in the Doha round and the lack of progress uh, in the development of the multilateral trade system, but also because it was clear to us and to everybody probably here in this room uh, that uh, with the new century, the changes in business models, uh, the, the huge shifts that we have seen uh, in, uh, in the way in which production and trade is organized uh, and other uh, type of developments uh, made it absolutely uh, critical that we review what we had in place uh, as frameworks uh, that govern over the interdependence uh, of the global economy. And, and so, so that's, that's um, a point I want to stress, is that many people think um, it is um, it's really only uh, in, the, in the trade system's uh, difficulties that you find recent for this thinking, but obviously, again, uh, as you look uh, at uh, uh, how countries are 
very busy uh, trying to come to agreements to deepen their integration among themselves in a selective manner, for instance, or to tackle challenges and other issues um, outside of that multilateral trade system, uh, that there was a need to look at the, at the broader uh, global trade and investment system. And what we found, I, I, I should say, uh, is that uh, indeed there is a, a big need to, to think about some of the assumptions, uh, some, of, some of the, um, uh, the very basics that have informed uh, the, 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 that governance of trade and investment in the past 60 years. Um, it, we also found that uh, uh, some of the fundamentals, uh, and uh, particularly the principles, for instance, on which the WTO is based, uh, continue to be uh, of critical importance. I think one of the things that comes out of that of the whole uh, uh, of, of that uh, body of work that is represented in that report, uh, and that's my interpretation, is that we need to to think more. Uh, carefully about the architecture of the global trade and investment system. Uh, for many years, the idea that the multilateral uh, arrangements were the first best option uh, in, a, in a way uh, clouded the possibility or, or, or uh, just delay even efforts to, to find other ways of addressing issues and resolving uh, the kind of uh, obstacles that we found uh, for to, to really generate more growth and to um, support and enable more of that integration of the world of the global economy, I think today that's that's very clear. Uh, we see just yesterday Christine Lagarde, David Lipton coming out with a warning about how fragile the, the global economy is, and many people talking uh, talking in very pessimistic uh, uh, tones about the next few years. Adam Posen. And, uh, and people in this house have been trying to, to show a more sober look of what we have. And, uh, uh, but what I think, again, uh, we found when we look through all this work that we have done is that many of the obstacles, many of the irritants, many of, of, the, um, um, of the issues, again, that may be holding back uh, growth uh, could be really addressed if uh, there was a purposeful effort uh, and a political decision uh, to take some of these ideas and move them forward. And so, uh, again, in, in, in as a set of, of, uh, of issues, we have organized them on around 240 policy options uh, that we found on the uh, 15 themes and three uh, uh, horizontal task forces uh, that work on this project. Uh, on those of, of those options, if we if they were to be implemented, obviously not all of them, some are, are alternatives and some are competing with each other, but if action was to be taken on many of them where um, things can be done, and what I mean is uh, not necessarily, again, in the multilateral trade system, but in different ways, thinking creatively about uh, the, the uh, very variable geometry that we have today in arrangements on trade and investment, uh, we could probably, uh, again, uh, move things forward in a very significant manner. And there, are, there are great opportunities on a, on a large number of issues. So the, the effort, as I said before, was organizing this first phase one uh, with the participation of about 375 uh, experts. Uh, we're uh, now planning to go into a phase two of engagement. We're already working on some of those issues. Uh, I'm very happy to hear Gary talk about uh, investment because that's one of the issues in which we're committed to move forward uh, in, the, in, the, in both institutions at the, with the World Economic Forum and ICTSD. Uh, we're convinced that uh, it's a high time to, to really, uh, again, uh, come into a, much, into a rationalization of, of what we have in terms of frameworks on trade and investment and to reflect with trade and investment uh, frameworks uh, the, again, the kind of changes that we have seen in the global economy. So that's one of those of those um, uh, of those issues that will be taken forward in, in that engagement phase. We're also uh, hoping that we can put on the table uh, of governments a number of other developments that could build uh, on uh, some of the of the kind of agreements that have come out in the regional sphere, in the bilateral sphere. Learn from them. Uh, try to, to bring them either to the multilateral arena or 
to other areas, uh, to, to other regions and other configurations. Um, there's a, a, a very big opportunity to do this. And within the WTO itself, we find opportunities beyond its negotiating function and the Doha round of negotiations. And, and I personally welcome very much the developments in Nairobi that will uh, has, have already freed the mind of the members in the WTO to think about, again, where action is pending. Uh, in the past few months, we have been going around talking to, to, to countries uh, in Geneva, trying to understand what are the, the issues of priority to them that they like to see addressed in the multilateral trade system. And much to our surprise, or maybe not, uh, we found that uh, many of those so-called new issues, but that are really pending issues, uh, are of the interest of the majority of the membership. Uh, some of the smaller countries, for instance, have uh, now uh, expressed that they like to see some work specifically uh, on the big challenges uh, regarding climate change and trade for instance. Uh, they like to also see uh, more specific and uh, work that, it, that is more inclusive on the questions like, uh, that, that we're very concerned about, like clean energy technologies. They, they like to, to uh, get uh, a discussion going on some of the ideas that um, um, Gary Horlick and the colleagues in the, in the um, A15 expert group on subsidies uh, have been looking into with respect to the rethinking of subsidies disciplines, not only in the WTO, but in trade agreements generally, uh, how the, 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 the need for, for these kind of safeguards for governments to be able to, uh, to tackle market failures, but also to create public goods, uh, can be really addressed with purposeful efforts. One of those issues, for instance, that I think is, is just very much written on the wall is the, the question of fossil fuel subsidies reform. And I see Ambassador Tim Grossard uh, in the room here, uh, who's been a great political leader on this question of fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, there's basically no excuse for the WTO members to now sort of freed from the, the formalities uh, that impeded that before under the Doha round uh, negotiations uh, to sit down and try to respond to what has been a call from the international community now for many years. It's been there uh, as a sort of, a, uh, again, a call, a very strong call from the G20 with instructions to the OECD and the World Bank, and uh, we've learned uh, quite a bit since 2009, and it's been repeated year after year. But now it has also come as a consensus in the Paris Agreement, in the context of the Paris Agreement, in the context of the uh, sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 of the UN, that uh, something needs to be done to tackle those fossil fuel subsidies. The only place really that we have, the only instrument that we have in the international economy to, to, uh, that could have teeth and could do something effective in this respect is the WTO. So, so there's, a, there's a, an agenda there um, that could be used to move some of, this, uh, of these ideas to, um, to help um, middle income, both lower and higher middle income economies, uh, get out of, uh, of uh, the, the sort of uh, growth trap that many uh, feel they're in uh, after the super cycle, the commodity super cycle that they have gone through and, uh, and with the, the slowdown that we see in the Chinese economy. Uh, there are ideas there that have to do with uh, uh, some of the concerns that they have with respect to competitiveness with embracing some of the new technologies. Uh, the, the, the expert group on digital economy, which is another topic in which we're very committed to move forward, has identified uh, also the kind of, of issues that would be necessary to really re-energize uh, the global economy by ensuring that flows of data and uh, uh, other uh, uh, benefits of these technologies uh, should offer to countries at all levels of development. So, so that's the sort of, uh, of uh, again, of issues that we have brought in and in the A15. We hope to engage with many of you. I see uh, many experts in this room, a lot of wisdom uh, on, on trade policy issues. Uh, some of the people that I've actually learned 
trade policy, uh, from whom I learned trade policy 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we hope that we can continue to engage with you, engage with governments as we move forward. Uh, we will be doing so uh, in cooperation with the World Economic Forum, but also with many of the other knowledge partners that have worked uh, with us uh, on, on this idea. So uh, I'll close here, Adam, and maybe we can have time and questions for more specific questions. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm in the cleanup spot here. Um, and so I encourage people to uh, please uh, eat their dessert and whatnot. Um, let, me, uh, let me make one or two uh, more institutional comments, and then I want to quickly hit some of the substance uh, here. Um, first, a bit of a user's guide, if you will, to this uh, complex maze of, uh, of intellectual output. So um, uh, we, as, as mentioned, over 350 experts, 57 countries, 16 partner institutes, 18 different expert groups or task forces, uh, quite, a, quite a maze. So part of our job as the, the co-convening uh, institutions is to sort of uh, help people navigate this better. So just for your information, you, you, there are about 150 think pieces uh, um, written by those experts that are the corpus of work underlying all this, which is available online. On top of that, there are 17 or 18 of these, very, of these vertical uh, policy recommendation chapters that are part two of the volume we released in Davos. They too are available online and some of them are printed uh, here. On top of that, we in the ICTSD put together a synthesis report, which is this uh, monograph looking uh, about 100 page document, which took a different cut. At, instead of doing it in the traditional academic way of taking topic by topic, uh, trade policy topic by topic, we took a bit of a transversal view from a political and policy from, from a decision maker perspective, and I'll come back to that in a second. And out of that is an executive summary, which is the easiest thing to digest, which we've also distributed uh, here. So you can either took a, take a classic academic vertical slice at this, if you're interested in seeing what's in investment or in climate or energy, as the case may be, or you can do, you can take a look in, in, at this from the perspective that I'm now gonna talk about, which is captured in the synthesis report, which is the way decision makers look at this issue, not trade policy experts. We wanted to make sure that we, we, we took the wisdom, but we translated it for, uh, for cabinets, for uh, boardrooms, and for kitchen tables. And this is part of the challenge, uh, generally, in international economic policy, and particularly trade policy. It can get extremely technical and, uh, and siloed very, very fast. Now, one or two cross-cutting remarks before I give you a little bit of a flavor for the, for the cross-cutting uh, user friendliness for decision makers of the way we try to organize this information. First, as Robert has done a great job of articulating, basically an underlying message of this entire exercise is that indeed uh, most of the trade policy community and indeed much of the political coverage has, has been very narrowly uh, focused or fixated on the formal part of the international trade and investment system, and particularly often on the multilateral formal part of that system, which is the WTO. The wider ecosystem that Robert talked about is probably the fundamental observation or insight out of this project, that there are uh, a, a range of different levers or influences available uh, to be tapped if one is interested in improving the effectiveness uh, of trade and investment uh, rules and institutional arrangements going forward. The formal, multilateral, plurilateral, and unilateral or national policy is certainly an important part of that, but informal aspects are key including the use that we saw pioneered in the trade facilitation agreement of a framework, a formal framework, but that has an open piece to it that allows for a, a process of progress through best endeavors and through capacity building assistance. That's a potential way forward in, in other domains as well. We're treating not just trade institutions and what they should do in this report, but a range of adjunct important aspects of, of economic policy and international institutions in the finance field, competition, and others, as Robert uh, indicated. And um, out of that comes some new approaches to old challenges and some new approaches to newer challenges in, in various perspectives. I think the, the, the political message that I would draw from this for all of you 
is, uh, is that I found it very interesting in looking across the, the, the body of work that if you zoom out from that narrow formal and particularly WTO-centric view of, of trade policy, you begin to see that there is a landscape of uh, an agenda, if you will, that looks truly common. And that just because the particular common agenda that was on the table in the WTO Doha round was not able to command a consensus. In other words, there, there was not able to be perceived among the various constituency a uh, fundamental uh, positive sum game value in it. Doesn't mean that that is not possible if one takes a wider scope, wider angle look uh, at the agenda. And to the contrary, as you will see in the synthesis report, uh, we found that there are major significant benefits for each conceivable major constituency or region in such a larger undertaking if you take that wider look. And what I'm now going to do is to give you a flavor of that. So one cut at this is growth. Uh, we have a few different chapters here. One is if you look at this uh, challenge through the lens of global economic growth, which has been decelerating and is a top-line worry in all sorts of places, certainly in cabinets and in boardrooms uh, around the world. Also, from a business perspective, people have been concerned that the business community was not fully engaged politically uh, on the multilateral agenda and even some cases uh, in other aspects of trade policy. There's a chapter here that, that sews together the various proposals that, that bubbled up in these different uh, 18 different uh, expert groups from the perspective of reducing commercial friction and strengthening investment certainty. Uh, we have also a package here that's interpreted for a number of things that would be seriously in the interest of least developed countries. Similarly, for middle income countries that are facing what Ricardo was referring to as the middle income trap, they're particularly uh, concerned about getting, about getting squeezed from less wealthy countries, more labor intensive on the one hand, and not being able quite to compete with the more advanced uh, production in, in uh, uh, sunrise industries that are uh, concentrated mainly in more advanced countries. There is a body of, of proposals here when combined uh, actually are strongly in the interest of countries that are trying to diversify uh, their economies and the like. Let me focus on growth first because it, it should be a top of line issue. I think, you know, historically uh, trade, out, trade growth has outpaced output growth by about two thirds. And this is robust through the 19th century. It, it uh, was robust also through the post-war period and even more recently until the financial crisis. That relationship has reversed, as, you, as you're probably aware. And if you, if you think about the challenge from that perspective, what can be done in a trade and investment uh, agenda that would help to provide an additional impetus to, to global economic growth this body of work comes out with the following uh, brief suggestions. One is that we got to re realize that uh, technical progress has historically been found by economists to be a principal, the principal contributor to long-term uh, improvements in growth. Um, secondly, the trade and investment system can be uh, organized in ways that would improve the global uh, allocative efficiency of both capital and labor. We're missing a few tricks in that regard right now. And thirdly, there are some aspects of industrial development that are particularly employment intensive. And in the context of a growth deficit uh, and an employment crisis in many parts of the world, it's worth thinking specifically about that as well. How can trade policy help to expand employment intensive industrial development and commerce around the world? Now let me hit each one of these uh, very, very briefly. On the first, the big source of technical progress that seems to be evident right now and available is in the digital area and related areas. Um, what, can, what could be done as an exercise in international cooperation that would scale or the diffusion of digital related uh, technical progress? Well, a few things in particular. One is to scale internet enabled uh, trade, particularly related to small and medium sized enterprises by uh, helping countries uh, develop single digital windows for customs and border uh, compliance, lower the transaction costs of people who are, who are, who are smaller players uh, to enter and to coordinate uh, what's needed to be able to enter uh, markets. Secondly, um, digitally enabled services platform. Again, 
uh, to help uh, improve the transparency and lower transaction costs with respect to complying with regulatory licensing and other administrative uh, requirements. Third, raise the de minimis customs level. Very, very prosaic sounding things, but actually these, these elements could be scaled in a way that expands significantly small and medium sized enterprise uh, commerce, which is already growing very, very rapidly, and not only in the major technically advanced countries, in many, many developing countries uh, as well. Data, uh, da the freedom of data flows. Uh, there's a large agenda, which is not WTO rulemaking, which needs to be worked through to capture the full potential of the data-related economy. You may have seen a McKinsey, McKinsey uh, Global Institute report to issue just in the last uh, 10 days or so, which found that uh, digitally enabled, you know, data-enabled uh, cross-border exchanges represents about as much as goods trade right now in its contribution to uh, expanding exchange internationally. There are a range of issues here that are really not ripe for a multilateral formal accord, but need to be worked through and could be worked through through more informal types of, of evidence-enabled uh, dialogue and informal standards and other arrangements. Privacy, intellectual property, consumer protection, e-signature, dispute settlement, and jurisdictional issues, to name a few. Now, that's not the way we normally think about organizing trade agendas, but it's actually the way we have to think about organizing agendas if we want to capture the full potential in that domain. And then finally, this paints a, a path potentially towards, in fact, a different way of bottom-up enabling a wider harmonization and scaling of that more digitally friendly ecosystem for international uh, commerce and investment, potentially through a plurilateral. The CEO of Alibaba has, uh, for the last six months, been talking about what he calls e an EWTO, giving birth to an EWTO. While that, uh, what, what is behind that concept is not fully uh, developed yet, as far as I am aware, one could envision a plurilateral process of like-minded countries, whether developed or developing, irrespective of regions, who saw fit to work together on these different pieces that I j just articulated for uh, improving the enabling environment for cross-border SME-related uh, trade, for data-related data uh, regulations and rules, uh, and um, raising de minimis uh, customs uh, requirements uh, or ceilings and the like. If the US, the EU, and China, and China has a big commercial interest in this area, were able to, to cooperate in some sort of a more informal process of this type, uh, you could envision a plurilateral arrangement that could be an MFM type of arrangement, uh, which would uh, be a big contribution to international progress uh, more generally. Similarly, uh, I'm just giving you one, one slice here of a flavor of some of the specific specificity here of, uh, of proposals that um, take a different architectural way of, of trying to advance pro progress. Let me, uh, let me end because I know we wanna get to the, uh, to the debate here, is that there, there are a few others that I would draw your attention to in particular. Besides the business ones, you've got a, a chapter in here about improving the legitimacy of the system and improving national policy space particularly given where, uh, how the political support for openness has, seems to have dropped or deteriorated significantly in this country and others in the last several years. It's worth it, I think, for people to give much more serious thought about some of the ideas like those indicated in the chapter in the synthesis report on improving national policy space to make societal choices for thinking about how one mobilizes a constructive response to those fears, but in ways that goes beyond some of the more traditional response, which has tended to fall back on the, how, how useful imports are. There really are some legitimate concerns. Gary hit on a couple of them in his discussions about investment. This exercise identified some uh, concrete agenda, I think that would make a material difference in this regard. I hope I've given you some flavor of the way this information is organized and how specific some of the agendas that come out of it are and the potential for progress uh, moving forward. Um, with that, let me stop and hand it back to Adam. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Can you throw this up on the stage? Could I ask our Richard, Ricardo, Robert, and Gary to come up on stage, take a seat? Um, we've covered a lot of ground. As Richard indicated, there's a lot more ground in the materials. Um, 
everybody has taken their shot, but we are very fortunate to have such an engaged, large and expert audience. So I'd, I'd like to turn it over to your questions and comments. Um, we, as our want is, we've got two ways of, of standing up. One, if you're near the back, is to go to the standing microphone. Uh, if you're near the front, Jessica will have a traveling mic after she makes sure that our speakers are all mic'd up. Um, please identify yourself when recognized to do a question, even if you think you need no identification at all. <laughs> I'm Adam Posen, by the way. I'm president of the Peterson Institute. Um, please, at the back mic. Hi, I'm Steve Charnovitz, George Washington University. I thought it was a fascinating presentation. I particularly like uh, Rick's presentation at the end where he talked about the uh, use of informal institutions and bottom-up and more participatory approaches because I think we're seeing you know, the limits now of what our existing multilateral institutions can, can do. Let me just note, start with what, something about what Gary said. It, it's very attractive, the idea of a multilateral regime on investment. They've been trying to do things like that since the League of Nations. Very attractive to have a regime. And as you say, let's have the rights of the investors maybe balance with the rights of the uh, uh, states and duties of the investors and package all that within a set of rules. Now, the MAI didn't try to do that, but one could imagine in the 21st century trying to do that. The, the problem I have with it is certainly, uh, although I agree with Ricardo, WTO has a role perhaps in investment, certainly not something that could go to the WTO. And I don't see any other international institution that can do it. We're not going to create a new one. So I, I come back to what Rick says about dealing with these issues more informally. And so um, uh, the I mean, when you think about the, the, the duties of the investor, uh, the duties of the foreign investor on environment and on labor and on other social issues are the same as the domestic investor, really. So it's a little odd to have a regime about the duties of the foreign investor separate from the duties of the domestic investor. So what do you, what do you just a question to the, to the panel um, on the investment, because I think it's a really important issue. Uh, what do you see as the phase two uh, of this effort? I haven't digested this book that I just picked up a few minutes ago. I'm sure there, uh, as Rick says, a lot of uh, outlines in there, but I'm interested in the phase two part of it. And then it's just in 10 seconds, I wanted to second what Bob Lawrence said about worker adjustment. It's an issue that's, that's really important that's uh, been left out uh, of a lot of debates. Thank you. Um, Gary, since you were first to speak and also most focused on investment, do you want to start off? Well, uh, Steve makes a good point. Um, maybe the best thing that can be done, and maybe even the E15 will do this in the next phase, is to suggest a model. This is what happened in the tax area over a period of years. There were various model treaties. And then as countries did their bilateral agreements, they re re referenced the model. They would often take parts of it, and that was the beginning of, let's say, the negotiation. And maybe that's as much as can be done, not a, not a big international, you know, new framework that all countries or many countries sign on, but instead just a, just a model reference which uh, then gets adopted case by case as bilateral agreements are negotiated. Robert? Well, I think um, building on this idea of, of a less formal or legalistic structure, uh, my colleague John Ruggie has worked with the United Nations and they have come up with a compact uh, as to for good corporate behavior. And in a sense, they have uh, enthused a lot of um, companies to sign on. And um, now there might be some role for um, monitoring, and a greater role for monitoring and accreditation uh, in order to qualify for that good housekeeping seal of approval. But there is a way in which the uh, consumer buying power can be harnessed in order to um, uh, make this kind of behavior, um, uh, rather than through formal investment treaties, uh, but rather because companies themselves run into great difficulties when um, 
you know, fires occur in Bangladesh and so on. Uh, that that's a whole other, that's a whole avenue which ex kind of exemplifies uh, what, what people in this project are talking about. Richard? Yeah, this is a good case study of the different pathways to progress. Let's just focus. Let me tell you the different pieces that are in here. The basic idea is for a, a draft model agreement to be framed, maybe building up from the UNCTAD work where they have established some principles. Uh, and secondly, uh, to add a few additional pe uh, features, because I know here, we're here in a US setting, but there are lots of different interests, particularly from, from developing countries. So one, one additional facet could be an international appeals process, would be opt-in, if you will. So if, if, if you are a parties to uh, a, an agreement that was based on the model, you could opt into an international appeals uh, uh, process. Citizen participation, hot button issue. So there's a particular proposal here not for citizens to be parties legally to a dispute, but rather taking a page from the OECD uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises to have an advisory or consultative committee that includes a range of non-state actors who are interested and have expertise to comment, make uh, comments on the proceedings and to be involved in a process for what that means for how the model framework should be refined or improved going forward. Fourthly, Developing countries have very limited resources to legally contest and engage in these disputes. The WTO created some time back an advisory center for WTO law, and there's a suggestion that something analogous be created with uh, pro bono or low cost legal advice available to developing countries on the investment side. The basic idea here is to get a dynamic of discussion among countries on what would be a, uh, a sensible model uh, a framework, encourage uh, by bottom-up voluntary uh, uh, agreement, the adoption of those principles or that framework into the re renewal of their own uh, bilateral or RTA investment uh, chapters, and to have a process over time that begins to try to identify opportunities to knit together or harmonize some of the modules of an investment framework across these different RTAs or bilateral agreements. So instead of an, a top-down uh, negotiation formally on a universal framework for investment, just the opposite, sort of a bottom-up process of, um, of consensual parties coming together to, to shape okay. and then adopt uh, Thank the framework. You. Thank you, Richard. Uh, at the back mic, please. Uh, hi, Osman Ahmed with PayPal and Georgetown University. A uh, question for Rick, I guess. Um, on the notion of an EWTO, it, it definitely sounds nice. But my question is, a lot of the issues that you laid out, intellectual property, customs, um, I could add financial services, investment, manufacturing, these are all becoming digitized spaces. So if you create something that's separate and that just looks at digital, when the rest <coughs> of the world's becoming digitized, are you, you know, separating something that shouldn't be separated? Like, how would you approach that? You know, the EWTO is a, is an Alibaba, right, right. Jack Ma idea. To my understanding, they're trying to think through what, what that would mean in practice. I cite that not so much because this exercise came out with a proposal for an EWTO, but what this uh, exercise did is identify a, a, a menu of, of issues that you know better than most of us need some international cooperation to be worked through and suggested that there may be, TPP has a, a pretty good running start in a lot of these areas. But uh, there are some open questions uh, there as well, and that there may be a very interesting opportunity for a plurilateral process um, uh, to work through some of these issues, and notably through public-private cooperation. Not all this needs to be formal, uh, formal accords. That's the idea. Anyone else? Please, and then at the back back, and then here at the front table. Steve Landing, Manchester Trade. A very quick comment on the origin rules, which you discussed earlier. There is a proposal that's sifting through, which is quite simple, maybe too simple, but it's to allow least developed countries or GOA beneficiaries that if the supply chain can certify that there are inputs from an LDC when the product enters the agreeable country and then enters for the duty reduction, more input more duty reduction. So that's just an idea moving around. So I think when, I was happy you mentioned that. As to the more general study, which is really the subject, um, 
we're going through a very strange part, time in the U.S., which I think was alluded to by the last speakers and so on, and that is that if you view an election as a plebiscite, 90% of those who are voting are against free trade. That is factually incorrect if you look at the <laughs> Pew statement, so please don't make no. outrageous statements. I will that. make my statement, and it's not outrageous. 90%? When you look at the votes, I'm just speaking about the candidates who receive votes in the primary. We all know the Pew studies. We all know all that stuff. I'm just saying 90% of the people will vote for a candidate who allegedly is against free trade. And, you know, I don't know about Hillary, whether she's against it or for it. Her positions are negative, at least for the moment. That's the only point I'm making. Of course we understand the more deeper questions. I don't come to be insulted, but I guess it's nice to be insulted when you get a little older. But let me go back to the point I'm trying to raise, which is trying to be constructive and so on. And that was to say that as you follow up with this study, if you make a requirement that you be an expert, you may not be dealing with those people that seem for the moment, at least in the US electoral process, to have a lot of influence. So my question was, how do we deal with these, we may call them nuts, but how do we deal with these people that seem to be having a disproportionate influence in the US political system, given the fact that your reports are really, your study is really designed to set the basis for a new trade policy? Thank you. Why don't Ricardo go first? Well, uh, no, thank you, thank you for that uh, question. I, I think um, it is a hard question. Um, I think, uh, to a great extent, it has to do with, um, um, even if it, if it sounds too simplistic, it has to do with language too. Uh, the the is easy to go against free trade, uh, as if it, that was a black box or just a, a very general notion. And uh, I think it's very important to bring about uh, some evidence of what the, the benefits of, um, of integration, which is really what we're looking into, integration of national economies into global markets, um, really what they bring to people, to the issues that concern people. So for instance, because you mentioned the debate here, and the debate on the TPP, there's a lot of um, animosity uh, from the environmental side. Uh, I've been doing uh, 25 years of trade and environment, and I cannot see uh, any agreement in the history of, of trade that would do more for the environment than the TPP uh, <clears throat> in, in ways that the international or the global environmental governance tools that we have today cannot do. Um, so, so again, it may be a question of going into specifics and making sure that we come out with the right, uh, with the right narratives, with the right stories, with the right evidence of, uh, of, of what, uh, uh, what are those benefits. But it's also, and that's, that's through the whole um, uh, report, um, it's, it's also making sure that the trade frameworks address the concerns that people have uh, and, and that they are inclusive, that they respond to sustainable uh, development issues, uh, that they respond to the labor adjustment questions. Uh, and, and, and that's, again, work that needs to be done. Robert, did you want to add well, something? Well, I think um, educating people and trying to give them a, a sense of, of reality uh, would make a valuable contribution. But unfortunately, it seems to me that the trade story plays into a narrative which helps people uh, understand the poor performance in the US economy over the last decade the slow wage growth, the loss of six million uh, jobs in manufacturing, combined with large trade uh, deficits, all of that, while we as economists and trade people may argue there was a, some contribution from, those, uh, from, from trade and to those phenomena, uh, there are much deeper and broader uh, driving trends that are causing it. But I think until we change the trends or until there are offsetting gains to the average citizen, uh, the trade narrative is going to continue to uh, kind of be out there uh, as a salient explanation. And unfortunately, I, I think it's going to be extremely difficult to change people's minds on that topic. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, day after the Michigan primary, I guess we had to expect that uh, these kinds of questions <laughs> would come up, if, even if they were not necessarily within scope of this particular exercise. 
Look, but I can't resist uh, responding. I, I spent years on wrestling with exactly with this, working for members of Congress who represented exactly these constituencies. Uh, in the Clinton White House as the lead person for labor, environment, and other very hot button issues. Two comments here. One is fundamentally uh, this is a matter of your domestic uh, structural policy set up and reform. And the U.S. has had feet of clay in a variety of domains that really matter in this regard for a long time. But on the international side, I do think that you have to take serious, we have to take seriously some of the concerns. And interestingly, to bring it back to the E15, there are a couple things in here that from my perspective as a long time a participant in exactly this kind of debate, there's some interesting new opportunities. We already talked about investment, but on the leveling up of social and environmental standards. Let me just tick off a couple of things to encourage you to look at. One is that we've got an opportunity here uh, for setting open clubs for common, setting common floors for, for supply chain practices. The G7 uh, initiative of Germany in the last round last year creates a political framework within which some interesting things could be done. One is to take what I call the Bagwadi rule. Uh, the Bagwa Jagdis Bagwadi articulated about 20 years ago that one constructive thing would be for multinationals to basically apply something similar to what their obligations are domestically on social and environmental rules into their, into their foreign uh, uh, subsidiary operations. That combined with uh, some countries that would do some jawboning and do some capacity building in developing countries for the next two or three years could actually make quite a significant a bit of difference. There's a lot more, but I've got to stop because I think I've been taking too much time here. But there are some ideas that take seriously some of these concerns if combined with a robust, inclusive growth set of structural reforms in the U.S. economies could, for the first time, provide a serious response to these concerns rather than the responses that I view to, the, to date and I think others would as, as wholly insufficient. Okay, I'm sorry to be rushing people, but we are getting near the end of our time, and I want to give our closing speaker a chance as well. So the final question will be here at the front table. Our, our people will respond, and then I'll turn to Annabelle. Thank you. Arbor Johnson with Itochu. This may be a little outside the scope of this also, but I'm just quickly wondering how um, you would suggest making sure that China especially, but also other countries such as Russia, India, would be included from the beginning in this um, grand vision to ensure that China doesn't feel compelled, for example, to do their own version, as with the AIIB. Thank you. Very astute question. Someone that care to address that? Well, I, I would say that is why uh, the WTO uh, has such a critically important role to play, because it is the location for inclusion. And it is, um, it, it does have all those countries as members. And so, so the notion would be that um, some of the uh, parts of the agreements, uh, actually in, in one place in the, uh, in the study, they mentioned the bilateral investment treaty that's being negotiated between China and the United States, serving as the basis for something broader uh, in a plurilateral type agreement. We've had some discussion about that, but nonetheless, that, that might be an example. Uh, similarly, uh, while China might not subscribe <laughs> to all the parts of the TPP, there are definitely significant chunks of the TPP that China is extremely interested in. So the notion would be that you could bring those parts into a uh, plurilateral agreement in the WTO and that, one, that way, countries like China and India would not necessarily have to sign on the dotted line to a template that were, they were not parties uh, to negotiating, but nonetheless could participate in several dimensions that are critically important and several uh, policy areas uh, that are critically important to them and critically important to us. Great. Could, yeah, Gary. Uh, just one, one comment on that. Uh, I think it's very important that the next president distinguish between our geopolitical differences with Russia and China, Syria, South China Sea, and there will be others, and our economic cooperation. It, I know that's hard to do, but we have a lot of economic gains by, for both of us by cooperating. 
while we have these geopolitical differences. Walking and chewing gum is difficult. Thank you. Ricardo, did you want to add something? No, I just want to say that, uh, that um, when we designed this exercise, we asked people to look forward to 2025 and into the, the, the world of, uh, of the immediate future, if you like. And, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is what you see here, is proposals that would be inclusive of the concerns and the needs that many of these economies have to further integrate themselves as we move forward. And, and that, that's very important. There's no way that, that any of these um, initiatives would be successful if they're not uh, responding uh, to those changes in the global economy. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call on a great friend of the Institute in World Trade, Annabel Gonzalez, who is Senior Director of the World Bank Group Global Practice on Trade and Competitiveness. She also, of course, was previously a very distinguished and successful trade minister for Costa Rica, has been working as a Costa Rican civil servant, and major mover on trade and economic issues for many years and has also played a leadership role in success of global agenda councils on trade and investment issues at the World Economic Forum. So we hope she can pull together the many strands we've dealt with today. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you, Adam, uh, for, uh, for having me today. I'd like to, of course, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, commend uh, uh, Ricardo and uh, Richard for their, uh, for their leadership in uh, in bringing this initiative uh, together. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an amazing initiative on, uh, on uh, many fronts, uh, but let me point uh, uh, three, uh, three reasons why I think it's very, very um, uh, significant. First is the high quality of the work uh, that is being done. Uh, they put together um, uh, an, an amazing group of experts, uh, uh, Gary and Robert, uh, are, are an example of the, of the caliber of the uh, people who participated in, uh, in this initiative, uh, academics, policy makers, uh, practitioners, uh, and others. Second, um, I believe that they produced a very, or they engaged in the discussion of very rich and relevant topics from the perspective of, uh, of the trade agenda. Uh, it was called the E15, I actually I think it's more like the E18 or and growing, uh, because uh, it, it refers to many of these topics that are very relevant to the, uh, to the international trade agenda today. And very importantly, I believe that they make uh, a very important effort to try to come up with this uh, set of pragmatic recommendations uh, in each of these areas. Uh, I think I heard the number 240 of them. Uh, and I think that this is something that is very valuable uh, as well. Um, and the third point is that I believe an initiative like this is uh, very timely. It's very timely on the one hand because I think that we are, we are at an important juncture in terms of the global trading system. The conclusion of uh, TPP, I mean, we are in, a, in a, you know, the environment of the sort of like uh, political discussion of it. But if you come to think about it, it's the, the most important uh, trade agreement that has been negotiated in the past uh, 20 years. I think that the negotiation of the trade facilitation agreement in the context of the WTO, um, even the results of the uh, Nairobi WTO ministerial uh, are showing the, you know, uh, uh, sort of paving the way uh, for this reshaping of the global trading system to take place. And in, in this context, it is very important to have sort of like a body of work uh, that, uh, that uh, 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 governments, uh, private sector can draw upon uh, to, uh, to think about what, uh, what next. Uh, Needless to say that uh, the discussion of these issues at the domestic level in many countries uh, is also, um, uh, you know, it also um, needs uh, some good analytical uh, um, uh, work. Huh? Um, now, I think that the initiative in itself has a lot of value, um, but it is important also to think about how to maximize the impact uh, of the initiative. And needless to say that, of course, events like this ones today to share widely uh, the, uh, uh, the content of the initiative, I think, are very relevant. But I also believe that it may be uh, of interest to think about maybe selecting three or four topics like investment or e-commerce or climate change, to name a few uh, that have been mentioned today, and maybe um, move more towards the advocacy role, um, uh, you know, building on this uh, sort of, you know, great material that has been produced, uh, can you actually uh, sort of take one step further uh, and, uh, and try to impact uh, maybe the discussions in the WTO? 
the discussions in the G20, in the B20, uh, relevant discussions at the country level with the business community. And I know that uh, a lot of this is being made, um, but maybe when we think about all of these topics and all of these recommendations, uh, it is difficult to have an impact uh, in all areas uh, with the same sort of uh, uh, magnitude. So maybe focusing on some of these uh, areas would be, uh, would be important. Now, the, my final point relates to uh, what next, and I think that, uh, you know, Robert and others have uh, made a point that there are, uh, of course, important topics to be uh, addressed as well. I think that, in a way, this has been a live process, and it's also relevant to think about how to sustain it uh, in the future. Um, and uh, one uh, idea that I think could be useful is um, uh, building or or sort of uh, continuing with some of these informal networks uh, that, uh, that E15 initiative has produced uh, and to expand these uh, networks around some of the key uh, topics. So um, my final comment is that, you know, the days when those of us who are interested in, uh, in trade issues uh, could get a full night of sound sleep uh, are over, uh, if they uh, were ever there. But uh, we certainly need to sleep with an eye uh, open right now. Uh, and I think that uh, the E15 initiative is uh, good material to keep us awake, while at the same time reflecting on, uh, on some of these important topics. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annabelle, and we'll hope to have you back to talk about what your priorities are as well in, in the near future. I'm very grateful to the E15 initiative, to our friends at ICTSD and the WEF for letting us share in the occasion to do a Washington launch. Um, very proud of the work that our people, but also the many other partners contributed to such an enormous project. Um, as Richard and Ricardo both stressed, there's a lot more there than we were able to cover today, but I hope, as I tried to say in my intro, and I, more importantly, I think was far more clear from the presentations, there's a level of specificity, of practicality, of pragmatic ambition in these, in these documents and in these proposals that I think is commendable. And if any portion of it moves forward, it will be a positive thing for the global trade agenda and therefore for the world economy. Thank you all very much for your attention. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.